Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. I'm just going to correct that. Someone edited my bio. I don't make great videos on YouTube. I make terrible videos on YouTube. <laughs> but nevertheless, I do make videos on YouTube from time to time. Um, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> this time next week, I'm going to be at Og Camp. Uh, Og Camp. Og Camp is a free culture unconference. Uh, so, in the spirit of, uh, uh, of Og Camp, this is an unpresentation. I don't have any slides. There are no slides here. Uh, the purpose of this is I did this at UbuCon in Zhejiang uh, 18 months ago. I in fact, did two of them. And I just basically stood in front of a room of people and I said, ask me things about Snaps and Snapcraft. So the first thing is, is everyone here somewhat familiar with Snaps and Snapcraft or is there anyone here who's coming into this cold and they don't know what this is? You have no idea what Snaps and Snapcraft, that's fine. Anyone else? Right then, for the benefit of yourself, snaps are self-contained software packages that are confined. Y you, as the developer stroke publisher, prescribe precisely what goes inside a snap. Snaps can run across 50 different Linux distributions, all from that one snap. Uh, there is a central software store where developers can publish directly their new software Users can discover it and install it. It works into the future. So a snap that you publish today will work on Ubuntu 18.04, 19.10, 20.04, 22.04, but also works on 16.04, 14.04, and other distributions with their forward and past releases. Did I miss anything important? Is that the high-level summary of snaps? I think, I think that was probably it. Does that make sense? Ah, right, good. Okay, so you, you have the background. Okay, so we're all, we're all on page one. So, who has questions about Snaps and Snapcraft? Yes, what's your name? Hassan. Hassan? Uh, quick question. Sorry, uh, we need to press the mic around because... Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, someone's going to be running around. I apologise. <laughs> Uh, does it auto-update itself if I install something as a snap and nowadays there are the products that are available as a dev and as a snap, so which one should I use, prefer, mm -hmm. and does it auto-update itself? Okay, so I'll tackle the auto-updating. Yes, by default, if you install a snap, pod publish, one of mine, it's brilliant. Um, uh, if I publish an update to that snap, you will automatically get it. You won't be prompted. It will just update in the background silently and you'll have the latest version. Properties of snaps can protect the fact that I push out a broken bit of software to you in that you know, I can run health checks and if those health checks fails, it will roll back to the previous version. So yes, snaps auto update by default. There are mechanisms by which you can defer when those updates happen. And you might be thinking, wow, if snaps are these big containers of stuff, that's big updates that I'm pushing down. The way snaps work is we generate deltas between the different revisions of a snap. So if I publish a new snap that you're consuming, you will only get the binary delta between the revision that you have installed and the new revision that's in the store. So you don't get a 100 megabyte download, you get maybe a meg or two, depending on what the delta looks like. Your next question was, should I consume uh, the deb or the snap? Well, the answer to that is it kind of depends. Um, if you have built your application to use a, very, a particular version of an application, a library or whatever, uh, then maybe the deb makes more sense because uh, that aligns with your expectations of what's required. But if it's a desktop application and you just want the newest stuff, chances are the snap is going to be the newer version. It will be kept up to date and quite often it's actually published by that vendor project or organization. So you know that's coming authoritatively from them. You know, Firefox comes from Mozilla, VLC comes from the VLC project, and there are countless other examples like that. Then you probably want the snap. Does that answer your question? Yeah. In fact, I've, I've noticed recently, just as an aside, uh, you'll be familiar with, um, if you try and run a command that doesn't exist on your system, as a command not found capability, and it says, oh, that command you typed in, you might want to apt install this thing. 
now, if you type in foo, and foo's not installed, it'll say, you can get that application by apt install foo, and it will say version one is available. And then it will say underneath, if the snap is available, or you can snap install foo, and version 2.4 is available. So you now get prompted, well, ah, I can see there's two versions here. Well, do I want the newest one, or do I want that one? So you can, you can choose that way as well. Okay? Good. If I remember correctly, um, the confinement is done with App Armor, but some distributions do not ship with App Armor or use SE Linux. Mm -hmm. How does confinement work there, and are there different uh, levels of, of confinement? For example, if you only have SecComp? Okay, right. So the question is, confinement works through App Armor. Um, how does that work on distributions that don't ship App Armor? Uh, and ha does it degrade to different levels of, s of, of confinement? So first of all, um, if you're not familiar with what AppArmor is, it's um, an LSM, a, s a security provider in the kernel, and there's AppArmor, ostensibly there's AppArmor and SE Linux that provide that. Um, Ubuntu, Debian, OpenSUSE, Solus, Manjaro, those are the ones that I can remember, use AppArmor. The Red Hats of the world, so Fedora, CentOS, RHEL, they use SE Linux, and most everyone else hasn't decided, and they use nothing, right? So, if you install Snaps on an AppArmor um, system, then you can get full confinement, which means that those applications are entirely isolated, they can't break out of their uh, can't, can't break out beyond what their expected operation is. So if I've said this application requires the audio interface, or more specifically, uh, audio playback, and it also requires the network, then it can do those things, but it can't access my webcam, for example. If I install the same snap on Fedora today, then in addition to AppArmor, we also have some uh, set comp uh, uh, restrictions and also C group restrictions. So we do the best we can through what those provide. So you get what's called partial confinement. Um, there's no good way for you to introspect what that means, but that's, that's the reality of what you get. And then if you're on something like uh, Arch, then um, again, we can do some confinement through set comp and C groups, but nothing beyond that. Uh, you could choose to install a kernel that's pre-compiled with AppArmor and change your position, for example. So, there are, it does degrade to the best that it can do. What we're working on is there's um, a, a development within the kernel which is LSM stacking, which enables multiple S LSM providers to be operational at the same time and to provide some pass-through from one to the other. So we're working on a mechanism by which if you're on um, RHEL, we can have AppArmor rules that then translate to the SE Linux equivalents and you will get, I won't say full confi confinement yet because this is hard, particularly in the network stack, but eventually the goal is to get, you know, um, complete confinement working on SE Linux systems. And the confinement for, y for example, the user data in your home directory, that's mm -hmm. only with AppArmor? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And then uh, last question, do you have an update for the desktop interface for the new version of the Snap Store? I'm not sure what you mean by that. There were rumors that there is an application in work that will replace the current Ubuntu uh, software center. Uh, there's no, no plans at this time. Okay. But it's still being worked on. Th there's nothing new to tell you okay. <laughs> at, at the moment. Yeah. Uh, so for clarity, the question is, um, we started working on a new Snap Store for the desktop, and there was some controversy, and we're not doing that anymore. <laughs> so I came a bit late, um, so maybe if that was already questioned about the performance thing. Performance? No, yes. we haven't so had a question I about performance. Okay, so I actually ship a Snap, that uh -huh. is a Python one. Right. Like it has all the dependencies come 
twisted and even most of the cryptography stuff as well. Mm -hmm. but the problem is that if I like don't byte compile stuff in that, like, am I okay to do some of the technical stuff, right? Yes, okay. totally. Sure. Okay. So if I don't byte compile Python files, each size is like 32 MBs. But if I do the byte, byte compile, uh, the performance does increase, but the size goes to like 48 MBs. Uh, so what's the solution for that? Is there something planned for that? Because uh, obviously size does matter for people. Okay. Okay. So size does matter in the app. And uh, uh, if you, for example, install the same software from pip, uh, that's like the same 32 megs, but it's not mm -hmm. in the case of a snap. Right. So the reason that the snaps are going to be bigger than, say, a pip install is because you will have a, a Python virtual machine inside the snap. Because as the publisher, you get to say, I particularly, I'm just uh, explaining for the benefit of everyone else. I have chosen this particular version of Python that I want inside my snap because that's the ver version that I validated. It's one of the uh, flexibilities of the system. That obviously means your snaps get a bit bigger in some cases. Your particular question is whether you should ship byte compiled Python, yes or no. Um, my first answer to that is that's your choice. You know, you can choose whether you want your snap to be bigger and offer those byte compiled Python files so that it operates faster or not. To your next question about whether or not you should, uh, you know, if there's a solution to the byte compiling, not that I know of, but that's a great bit of feedback. Right. So I'll, I'll take that because that's something we could look at implementing so that in the writable area that the snap has available, the byte compiling happens so that after the first run, which will be a bit slower because that byte compiling needs to take place, subsequent runs will be faster because th those objects will be available. Yeah, so for my particular case, uh, that software itself is supposed to run on the Raspberry Pi. And if I don't byte compile, right. that takes like 30, 35 seconds. Right. And so I, I would say for now, your best option is to byte compile everything inside your snap and just own. And that th the other thing you can do is because you get to prescribe precisely what's inside your snap, um, I'm going to get into some real snap specifics here. You can choose not just what goes inside it, but what you eject. So I know you know a lot about snaps. Sorry. That's all right. Thank you. So I know Irma knows a lot about snaps, so forgive me. In the um, stage and priming steps, because you know your application and you know precisely what it requires from Python, you could choose to unprime the Python modules that you know your snap is not going to use. I do this, in s I'll show you some examples later, okay, where I've done precisely this. So um, I created snaps of um, Magnus and Pick that Stuart Langrish create created, which are um, GTK Python applications. They're five and seven megabytes respectively. Because what I did was I ejected all of the stuff from the snap that I know those applications don't require, but get pulled in as a result of me saying, I want Python. So I'll show you some examples of where you could do that to make the snap really small, and then you can byte compile all of your stuff, and you'll probably end up with something that's smaller than the 32 megabytes that you have for an uncompiled snap right now. Okay, um, last year um, there were a few questions. Uh, You're right in front of the camera. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there were a few questions. Uh, you already uh, talked about uh, some of the issues that we discussed last year. Mm -hmm. There's still one uh, to which I know there was some progress, but I want to know if there's something else coming, which is theming. Mm -hmm. uh, so is there something new regarding that coming? So there is an item on the roadmap. Um, that has been there for some time to, to I'll tell you what the ultimate solution is going to be, and it's been on the roadmap for a while. And to just have a peek behind the curtain of how we do things at Canonical, we have um, uh, product sprints, product strategy sprints every three months, where we get together uh, and decide what it is we're going to be working on. And we do a load of horse trading between the different teams. 
you know, and I will say, I want this feature from you, and, and then I have to argue with everyone else that wants features from that team to get my thi thing prioritized, okay? So that's how we do this horse trading. So the ultimate solution is going to be this. Um, you will have an app graphical application installed. It will run. It will introspect what theme you currently have set as the default theme on the system. It will look to see if that theme exists as a snap, and I'll get to that bit in a moment. And if that theme is not currently installed, it will automatically go out and get it and install it so when that application runs, it is themed correctly based on your user preferences. That all sounds remarkably simple, except for this. The CS CSS that exists in GTK themes is kind of like an ABI. Themes written against GTK 3.16 or 3.18 are not compatible with 3.20 or 3.22 or 3.24. So the other thing this will be doing is looking at that snap that you're about to run, what version of GTK is it using, so not only gets a themed snap that matches your preferences, but for the version of GTK that's used inside that snap, okay? So we've designed this, we know the scope of the problem and how we want to solve it. That roadmap item has never made it to the top of the pile. There is a roadmap sprint in Vancouver in four weeks. That's at the top of my wish list at the moment and the one I'm going to be advocating hardest for because I really want that feature to land for 2004. Now, I've expressed my aspiration to all of you here. That may not happen, but that's, that's the solution that we're going to go for eventually and that's the one I'll be advocating for. Yeah, more of a end user specific questions. Sure. Uh, there are publishers uh, uh, that do not publish snaps, or for that matter, any other kind of app image or a flat pack. How do I convince them? Or uh, these are I'm talking about paid applications that mm -hmm. I want to pay for them and I, I want to buy them. But since they don't have a snap or something specific, uh, how do I convince those uh, software publishers? Um. Right, okay. Well, in simple terms, you can ask them. This doesn't get you very far. So for, for the last two and a half years, that has been my life, right? You know, I was the guy that went to Spotify and said, you should make a snap. And their first response is, what is a snap and why should I do it, <laughs> right? So uh, were you in the presentation I gave uh, a couple of hours ago? Yeah, I was in the previous right. one, yes. Okay, so when I was talking about discovery uh, to millions of Linux users. It's a single application, a pu you know, published thing that's available for all of Linux, you know, for all of the different distributions. It's those arguments that go across best with ISVs and application publishers to explain to them it's an app store experience because they all understand what that is, right? They're, if, they're, if they're making an application right now, you can guarantee it's in the Mac store, the iOS store, Google Play store. I was going to say Windows store, it'd be a lie. Some applications are in the Windows store, but you get the idea. They're, they're in the, the thought of it's an app store paradigm. So if you tell them, this is the Linux app store for Linux, I want to be able to get my software from here authoritatively from you, for all Linux users, it eases discovery. These guys will help promote your software to a Linux audience, and we do that all the time. We're happy to do it. It's tho those arguments are the ones that you have to go to the publishers with. Just saying, I want your software in this format is not going to cut it. You have to give them an incentive, and that's the best one that we've found right now that works. Well, the incentive that I gave them is, you know, uh, word through my wallet. I did not buy that software. So I went with another uh, right. vendor who, who was giving, willing to give me something and which is compatible. Yeah, also but to convince them to, yeah. to advocate or to sell uh, Snap, uh, 
Right. Uh, is that something that I can do as as a community user, as an end user yeah. perspective? Something yes. that I can do to promote Snaps? In the case of proprietary applications where we really can't like go and get at the source in, in order to uh, you know, add a Snap, for example, although you can. That's a probably a separate talk for another day. Um, um, proprietary vendors, yes. Telling them about it and that's where you want to get your software from is a great way to advocate. If you've got some development skills, if you're familiar, familiar with what it's like to build software, <laughs> then the other thing you can do is you can create a Snapcraft YAML and submit it to a project as a pull request and say, here is a thing that will enable you to publish your software in this store, and by the way, here are the links to the documentation where you can automate that pipeline so, so it just happens automatically. Because a lot of the time when you approach a, uh, an ISV and say, come and do this thing, haven't got time. There is no time to do that. I have zero time. They don't understand the scope of what it, what it means to maintain a snap. And it's really low. Because once you create that initial YAML and you validate that the snap that comes out of that works, it's very rare that you have to go back and tinker with that. There are major ISVs who I created the snaps for in the, at the end of 2017, and I still have contact with those organizations, and I look at what we sent them, and it hasn't changed in two years. They're using the exact same stuff, which is very different from DEBs and RPMs, where each release, you need to validate that those libraries are the same versions that you had there. And actually, oh no, there's been a major library bump in Ubuntu. And now my application doesn't work because it expects this older version of a library. So not, what does the developer do? Do they now uplift their software to support this new library? Well, all that goes away with a snap. There's none of that flag day release nonsense happening anymore. <laughs> but yes. As a community contributor, you can absolutely advocate for Snaps, and I would l love you to do it. And if you, if you get somebody who's interested, contact us. We'll be happy to help. So basically, uh, what you just said, like, uh, is this uh, from a user's perspective to go with a snap craft YAML and something? Um, let's say reverted to the old days um, as a Debian packager as well. I mean, I sometimes even ended up like from personal experience, even packaging stuff that is basically proprietary. It's just a tarball dump of some mm -hmm. binary crap, mm -hmm. um, just for using basically the software distribution mechanisms we have. Right. with their internal in the kind of organization or scope we are working with. Is this something also that we could leverage with Snap? I never worked with it, but basically just like wrapping a tarball, using some base stuff on bringing that in the right paths or yeah. bringing that with some functions on yeah. to ship that basically. So the answer to the question is yes. What's being asked here is I already have a CI CD pipeline that is creating some blessed binaries of my application which maybe I ship as a tarball, or it gets transformed into a deb. There are, there's a mechanism inside um, Snapcraft in, the, in that YAML. Um, there's different um, keywords to define the nature of the project I'm snapping. So one of them is Python. That uses a Python plugin, as we were just discussing, to scaffold up Python and all the stuff that you need. Uh, and it knows ha how to pass setup.py and requirements.txt. And the make plugin knows what to do with make files. And the CMake plugin knows what to do with CMakes. You don't have to learn new build tools. It, build, it sits on top of all of the stuff that, that's already there. In the case of things that are binaries already, because they've been built in CI, for example, we have a dump plugin. And you literally just say, take this tarball or take this directory and ingest that into my snap. And if there are additional libraries that that application requires to function, there's a mechanism to say, these are the names of those libraries in the Ubuntu archive pull those into my snap as well to create the runtime that this application needs. And all, this is a very common pattern, all of the major ISVs 
So Microsoft, Skype, Spotify, just all the big boys, this is exactly how they publish their snaps. Even Mozilla do it this way. They have CICD, compiles and builds a bunch of binaries, and then they have a step at the end that just snaps the thing by saying, take that tarball or that directory of binaries, add these libraries, and here's a snap. Super simple to do. Okay, and that even brings me to the next question. Um, let's assume that just this case that it's like some proprietary stuff, you mm -hmm. know, and we also don't as a user, you know, organization or consumer of that one, of course, don't have any redistribution rights for that one. For the libraries? For basically the snap package for that one. Can result because we got some Euler whatever shit or, or crap. Um, but like basically we just using that like with Debian packages, like as a software distribution mechanism. Right. Um, what we would have ended up in the old ways, you mm -hmm. know, would have we set up an own uh, repo that we could access, which is just private, you right. know, um, where we could basically distribute that without redistributing it, you know, just right. internally. You're on difficult oh. ground there. <laughs> um, so we have worked with vendors who have very judicious review of the libraries that get bundled inside the SNAP and those licenses that those libraries come under and whether they are comfortable with essentially redistributing those libraries alongside their application. Now, remarkably, the organisation that takes that more seriously than any other is Microsoft. It's actually really interesting to see how carefully they go through that process. But if you've got a requirement on a library and you don't think you can ship that library or redistribute it because of licensing reasons of your application, then you're kind of on dodgy ground already, right? Because if your application requires that library, then you need to be compatible with it in some regard. No, uh, what I'm actually referring to is just like without using this uh, store approach or mm -hmm. this mm. single uh, store approach, okay. I just want to leverage basically the software distribution ah. mechanism that you actually created excellently. Okay. But internally, without redistribution, and even right. if I have a certain license with a certain vendor, yes. I mean, I can use my own software distribution with inside the company right. as long as I don't okay. redistribute, but I just distribute so within, basically. If I understand, you want to create a snap and then distribute that snap via internal means, never publishing in the store. Yes, you can do that. There are some caveats. So certainly, as a developer, you can create and build a snap, and then you can install it immediately without having to go through the store. However, when it's not published through the store, the uh, publishing keychain doesn't exist. So you have to acknowledge that the snap you're installing is, and the, the keyword is, dash dash dangerous. That's what you actually have to type on the command line to acknowledge this is unsigned, I don't know where it came from. But you can do it. You could send me that snap. And I could snap install foo.snap dash dash dangerous and I would get that snap on my system and it will function. Okay? It will work. But also, snaps that are sent around in that fashion, zero update story. Okay? So there's no automatic updates because there's no store connected to that snap. Right, so if you want the automatic update capabilities, then that's what the sto store's there to provide. Okay, then I would even like to uh, extend that question okay. a bit because it's really interesting. I mean, we see that like with the single app store approach per platform mm -hmm. on the mobile scene. Mm -hmm. um, let's say for free software advocates that created some problems because we're basically relying on like uh, those vendors like Apple and Google on their mm -hmm. stores and their regulations. As you might know, like there's a certain uh, uh, initiative around the whole F-Droid stuff, yeah. Yeah. where we also leverage the cool stuff from reproducible builds from Debian guys. Yeah. And But I mean, that basically brings us to the question, am I able to operate at a third, uh, further point in future or are there intentions to enable that uh, an own version of the store myself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which would basically also solve the problem for me if I want to use that basically software distribution method, mm -hmm. like I did with Debian repertories, uh, repertories, 
Um, if I'm able in the future to might be able to do so with Snap as well. Right. So Just for using it as a software distribution method internally yeah. for stuff I can't distribute for reasons. Okay. Um, the short answer is, uh, is there, you're asking if you can operate your own store. Not now, but... No, but yes. Uh, but probably not in the way that you're looking to, to do so. So, no, there is no uh, freely available version of the store that you can self-host and run yourself and put your snaps inside it. <coughs> For those enterprise requirements where you need to own and operate your own store, we have an enterprise store proxy. That is a paid service. It's one of the ways we monetize this project because that's for enterprises to do all of the things that you've just outlined you wanted to do. So if you want to do that, come and talk. Well, not to me, I'm not a salesperson, but I can <laughs> connect you with the right people. But there's an enterprise store proxy for that purpose. Um, at this time, there are no plans to open source the Snap Store. How much time have we got? We have time for one more question. One more question. Uh, so someone wants it. First of all, it's someone that has not had a question yet. I guess not. Time to make it choose the truth between two persons. <laughs> Flip the coin. Flip the coin. Yeah, okay. So what's the scope of a Snapgraph summit? We see that on the internet occasionally, yep. like every four months, six months. Every six months, yeah. So is that like the UDS of Snapcraft? Yes. <laughs> right, okay. So uh, for, for those of you relatively new to the Ubuntu project, which includes myself, I never went to a UDS. They're amazing by all accounts. That was the Ubuntu Developer Summits. And the question is, is, is a Snapcraft summit uh, like a UDS? Um, and a Snapcraft Summit is so, uh, an event that we run every six months or so, six or seven months. We invite people from industry and the community to come and have a three-day hack fest with us somewhere in the world. We've done four of these so far in New York, Montreal, London, Seattle. Those are the three places we've done them. Um, and we usually have a theme of the people that we invite to those events. And when we invite those people, we pay, pay all of their costs. So we pay for all of these people to fly to wherever it is we're going to be. We put them up in a hotel for a week. And then for three days, we hack on stuff. Some of it is they o operate a really interesting project that we would love to see in the store. So we invite them to basically buy their time for three days to make that happen. In some cases, we know they've got a really complicated project. And we wa want to learn as much as we can from them about how to uh, uh, get Snapcraft to well support what they're doing so we can learn and build a better platform. Um, so the last one we did in uh, Montreal was all about language ecosystems. So everyone that was there was from a language or build tool or CI system. Now, it grew in scope because that was the Snapcraft bit. At that event, we also had roboticists from Canonical, from Open Robotics, from Amazon, from a bunch of companies I can't remember the names of. But we had another group of people there just working on ROS and the robot operating system and SROS, which is the secure layer for that. And then we had another group of people that were working on um, device enablement. So we had people from Pine and our enablement team and Raspberry Pi and they were sat there just doing board enablement and getting Ubuntu Core to work better on those devices as reference platforms that were low co cost and accessible. So it's just this mash of extreme hard mode coding during the day and then, like here, going out and making friends in the evening. You know? So that's what a Snapcraft Summit is. Us to learn from the best in the business and hopefully bring them to the platform in the process. All right, so I think that's it then. Thank you and see you tomorrow, guys. <laughs>